Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our study of the Eastern Front. This is the fourth set of Eastern Front shows we've done, not counting a few specials here and there. And today's show continues a little bit about what we were talking about yesterday with Indian Idell. We're talking about that situation over 42-43, but this particular bat battle, uh, it kind of connects what Pritt was talking about Monday because it's f south, further south than Leningrad, further north than Stalingrad. It's kind of that middle area there, and I'm delighted to have the d discussion about with you today. If you're new to the channel, please don't forget to click the button to subscribe. Don't forget to click the little extra bell to get the notifications, and maybe consider becoming a YouTube member or a patron if you like what we're doing. My guest today brings 20 years of research into his grandfather's role in this battle, and he joins us today from Canada, Sergei Vershinian. I'm going to bring you in now on screen. Good afternoon, sir. How are you today? Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm okay. So it's always great on World War II TV when our, our historians have a direct connection with a family member to the battle they're talking about. And in your case, it's your grandfather. I think you're the first guest we've ever had who has a, a grandfather who fought for the Red Army. If, if there is someone else I'm forgetting, I, I apologize to that person. I think you are. So as a young person growing up in, 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 in Russia, when were you first aware of this, of your grandfather's role? And when were you first aware of, of this battle and, and, and the fact it hadn't really been talked about very much? Thank you, Paul, for this introduction. I mean, um, yes, it is really uh, for me a personal story because it's uh, uh, my interest uh, was uh, to resolve a mystery. It was a mystery in my family. Uh, the, the mystery was where my where is the grave of my grandfather? We got uh, the uh, death notice, but it ran no place of uh, where he was buried. It was uh, unclear for me how it is possible. He he did he was not missing in action. He 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 died uh, after he got wounded in uh, in a hospital in a military hospital. How it is not possible that we don't know where he is buried? Mm. And uh, um, uh, but it was uh, very very difficult to research it because. Uh, the paper ran no unit number. It, it is in millions of uh, casualties at the Soviet site. It was nearly impossible to find uh, someone if you don't know the, uh, the exact unit number. But I managed this. I spent several years with my uh, with discussions with my uh, uh, with the Russian archives and in the military archive um, uh, of military med medicine archive. I found uh, his uh, hospital papers. And uh, then I finally got the place where he was buried. It was near the Seliger Lake uh, in, the, in Russia's northwest. Uh, and I also knew the unit number. And from that time on, it was 2003, actually. Um, um, uh, I knew everything. Uh, uh, I was needed for further research. And then I started my research. I, I, I started to... Um, uh, find out where what was the number of the uh, rifle division he was part of, what was the the action he was got in, and and so on. And uh, at, by that time, I was lucky to catch some uh, Russian veterans alive. I, I mm. was talking to them directly, and uh, they told me lots of interesting things about the battles there, and uh, but uh, no information on my grandfather because. Uh, there were so huge losses that it just uh, those who survived the, um, and managed to get out of this uh, were only the wounded in the first battles. In the first uh, uh, battles, they were involved. They were wounded. They were carried back to rear, and in, 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 in this way, they survived. And um, so it is a personal story for me. And um, as I knew German, uh, I know German, I uh, was able also to communicate from the German, with the German side. I went to the internet, and that, uh, that was uh, um, uh, 2000 something, and uh, found out uh, who were fighting from the German side. And I got my first photos, first maps. The Germans actually helped me to locate where, where they uh, uh, exactly the villages where uh, uh, my uh, my grandfather was trying to capture in July 1942. Uh, I got even the maps, even the handwritten maps uh, from the Germans uh, mm. of the positions. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, um, I, I got lots of information, some uh, word diaries from Germans, some letters, some books. 
um, you know, but the, this general interest for history was always with my generation because my generation was growing actually when the uh, this cult of the great victory in the mm -hmm. great patriotic war was uh, taking its final shape in the Soviet Union. Uh, 1965, uh, it was the first time the, ninth, uh, the uh, May 9th was offic uh, an official day off in the Soviet Union. And 1970, it was uh, 25 uh, uh, year uh, uh, celebration, 25 years uh, from the beginning of the, uh, from the uh, Great Victory Day. And uh, so the this um, war history was everywhere. It was uh, in every school. You have all the portraits of pioneer heroes. You know all the faces. You know uh, all the books. You know the 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 the, the Soviet films on that. Uh, so we were growing through that, and um, of course, I was always wondered. Uh, I, I always wondered why it is so dehumanized. The whole history, you know, you know, uh, lots of uh, battles: Stalingrad, Moscow, Kursk, uh, Berlin battle. But you don't know the details. You uh, rarely give the view from the trenches. You rarely give. Mm. Uh, uh, get uh, information how it was uh, really uh, on earth. Um, and, and is it true in, in, in the Soviet Union at the time? Well, we talked yesterday with Indy Nidell about the fact that today a lot of people who have an interest in the Eastern Front, it is that we call them the city battles, but often they're not just in a city, but Leningrad, Stalingrad, right. Kursk, we talked about Berlin, and actually a lot of the other areas like the, the, you know, the salience, uh, when it is about armies uh, annihilating each other, and it isn't about towns, it isn't about cities, it isn't about transport hubs, it's simply about, about a, a battle to best the enemy. Those battles seem to be less well known. Was that also the case when you were growing up, that the, the, the big concentration was on those, you know, the, the Stalingrads and the, and the, and the Leningrads? Yes, uh, that's true. Uh, I mean, uh, we were concentrating on the successes of the Red Army, not yeah. on the failures. And the battle I'm going to, to, uh, to tell about, uh, to talk about today is... Uh, cannot be uh, described as a big uh, success of the uh, Red Army. I mean, uh, not a complete failure, but not a big success. It's that period of the war we've been talking about this week, 42-43, when both sides are still on the offensive, but they're also defensive. They're, they're, they're straightening out the lines. They're these pockets, which we talk about a lot tonight. And both sides are experiencing some of the the beginnings of how it's going to be later on. So the Red Army is starting to get better at things, but not how they're going to be in 44, 45. The German armed forces right. are, are, are still doing quite well, but they're still starting to show signs of the weaknesses they'll show later on. But anyway, we digress. You've come armed with a PowerPoint. Um, I'll, you're going to take us through this. Folks, we will do questions at the end today, but basically I think you're going to all sit back and and, and be grateful that we've got such an amazing guest telling us a fantastic story that I don't think many of you will know about. So over to you to take us through this. Thank you, Paul. Uh, so uh, the battle I'm going to, to talk about today is the Demiansk pocket. Uh, it was uh, um, uh, just to give you a, a brief idea well, where it happened, actually. So the German advance in Russia's northwest in 1941 was very quick. I mean, in three in, in in three months, the Germans get up to north, up to Leningrad, up to Novgorod and Demyansk. So Demyansk was captured. If you look at the map, you, you see this uh, part. You, you see Leningrad um, above uh, Gulf of Finland, uh, Ladiga, uh, Lake Ladoga. If you go down a little bit, uh, roughly 350 kilometers, you you, you see Demyansk there um, at the right. Uh, part of the slide. And uh, Demyansk is um, actually a small town. The Germans got there probably uh, by, by the end of uh, September 1941 and stay there until the, uh, uh, the Battle of Demyansk began in, uh, <clears throat> in January 1942. And um, it was actually um, the big plan of the Stavka, of the Russian uh, uh, leadership, military leadership to um, go further. Um, after Moscow success in, 19, in December 1945, when the Red Army pushed the Wehrmacht uh, a bit uh, to the west, uh, they um, they decided we have to 
um, developed this success, and the Northwestern Front, which is also, uh, which has actually commanded this portion of the Eastern Front, uh, planned a big operation. Uh, it was actually part of a great uh, plan um, made by Stavka, by Stalin, and uh, uh, to. Uh, um, to cut the supply lines of the whole group army, uh, army group north of the German Wehrmacht. Uh, so the main plan was uh, to strike here from uh, 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 Lake Ilmen uh, through Stare Russa, which was on the railway uh, line um, from east to west here described uh, here uh, depicted on this uh, map and go up further north to uh, to cut uh, the supply lines of the 18th army of uh, which was also part of the army group north and uh, as such uh, um, they decided uh, to to to, uh, to 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 make to give them uh, to make the main strike here because it was the junction between the two army groups between the two sorry between between the two armies between the uh, 18th army in the north and the 16th army who was standing here and uh, um, actually the plan was uh, a bit too ambitious as the reality showed and the first strikes at Stara Russo showed that the uh, Germans are um, good enough to uh, recapture this uh, the, using the heavy artillery which actually the old Russian armies um, deployed in this uh, part of the front uh, were not having and uh, the reality showed that the whole plan went wrong. And at this time, uh, Stavka decides, uh, okay, uh, in this case, we, we have to take what we can, what we are possible, what we are able to take. And uh, we can encircle uh, the German, uh, the part of the German 16th Army, uh, six divisions, three of them belonging to the second army corps, and uh, three of them belonging to the 10th army corps. And uh, at this moment, the first shock army, uh, also depicted here uh, above uh, Demyansk, arrived at the front, uh, who was commanded by Vasily Kuznetsov. And um, the uh, third shock army, also marked with uh, this uh, red flag uh, to the south, uh, they both uh, strike at the same time. And uh, um, uh, at Zalucia, they will reunion and so encircle the German troops. And this plan, this part of the plan went uh, well, actually. Um, it was a first major encirclement of uh, Wehrmacht in the history of the World War II, actually. Uh, nearly 96,000 men were initially uh, encircled in, the, in this pocket. And uh, the encirclement was finished on February the 8th, 1942. Um, a Red Army had roughly around 400 thousand men around the pocket at that time. It is very difficult to talk about the figures of the Russian troops later on because um, there were too many actually participated at, uh, at these battles, at these efforts, continuing and continuing efforts to all the um, uh, year 1942 to demolish, to, to annihilate this uh, pocket. Uh, but, at the, uh, but initially it was roughly uh, 400,000. Um, actually, the whole plan uh, was worked out uh, on the encircling plan was worked out by the Western Northwestern Front, uh, which was commanded by Pavel Kurochkin. Uh, you, you see him on the left, and on the right picture, you see him in the center. And uh, standing is the his chief of staff, Nikolai Vatutin. Uh, the two major uh, uh, strikes were made by first uh, shock army commanded by Vasily Kuznetsov, who actually then participated at the Stalingrad battle later on, and Maxim Porkaev, who commanded the third shock army. Actually, my uh, grandfather was part of the third shock army, but he, he joined later as a reinforcement in the late of February. Uh, Maxim Porkaev was, by the way, the uh, military attaché of the Soviet Union 1939-1940 in Berlin, where the uh, Molotov and Ribbentrop Pact was signed uh, between the German and uh, Germany and the Soviet Union. 
Um, here are, you, you, you see the pictures made in March uh, 1942. These are the men from the unit of my grandfather, photographed by a war correspondent. They are proudly showing the uh, German boots, uh, improvised German boots uh, for, to, to, to protect them for frostbites. Uh, and the, on the right picture, there are some landmines they also they captured while uh, having uh, uh, kept uh, while having taken a village from the German from the German troops. Of course, the Germans uh, knew that they are at risk of um, they are at risk of encirclement. Uh, Wilhelm Ritter von Lieb, uh, who commanded the Army Group North at that time, was. Uh, uh, was aware of this risk, and he proposed to Hitler, let us move uh, the whole uh, Second Army Corps behind the lower trigger, because we are not able uh, to um, uh, to prevent the encirclement. It would be, re uh, it would, of course, in this case, we would leave all the heavy equipment, uh, but we would save the men, uh, we, we would save our personnel. Um, Hitler said no. I mean, at that time, uh, he was uh, absolutely obsessed with this Haltebefehl, um, yeah. uh, Haltebefehl and uh, uh, he regarded that these uh, land gains near Demyansk is a good platform for the further development in course of the summer, in course of the spring and summer 1942. It is uh, one of the uh, areas uh, we can develop our further uh, steps towards Moscow when the uh, weather would allow us, as well as Rzhev. That's why um, um, he, he said no. And uh, the Wilhelm Ritter von Lepp was actually a relief from command of the Army Group North uh, on January 15, 1942. Kukler uh, assumed command of the um, Army Group North. So Ernst Busch, uh, German general uh, com who commanded the German 16th Army at that time, gave the order, stay where you are. Uh, you have to defend the positions you hold despite the risk you are encircling, you, you are getting encircled. You have to stay where you are. You are not allowed to break through to the German mainland to the eastern part, to the east. And um, the organizer of the whole command, of the whole defense uh, at this <clears throat> uh, positions at Demyansk was Walter Graf von Brockford Alfred. He was one of the, uh, who commanded the second army corps. He was a German noble name, uh, nobleman actually coming mm -hmm. from a noble family and uh, uh, very much known as uh, uh, of his uh, antipathies toward the Nazi ideology actually. Uh, very much known are his quarrels with the uh, uh, SS Totenkopf Div division, who was under his command in the Demian's pocket, uh, who was always blaming him of uh, uh, putting them on, uh, deliberately putting them on the uh, especially risky places inside the pocket where they were. Uh, so he, he was uh, actually thinking he, I'm, um, there were less, uh, these, uh, these SS troops are less worth for me than the ordinary German infantrymen. And um, he was, uh, uh, it was not an easy task actually for them to organize the whole defense. Because if you look at the terrain uh, there, if you look at the map there, this is the area, this first of all is a huge area. I mean, uh, from east to, to west, it's uh, approximately 100 kilometers and from north to south also 90 to uh, 100 kilometers. The Germans were controlling actually these, uh, uh, railway uh, line uh, uh, from Valdai to Stara Russa, and such prevented uh, prevented the supplies of the Russian 11th and 4th uh, and the 1st uh, Shock Army. Um, uh, so the Germans were sitting in the snow. The temperatures at this moment were below uh, 30, sometimes below 40 uh, wow. degrees. Uh, and uh, the Germans do not have uh, the equipment, do, they don't have the proper clothing to, for this uh, 
uh, fights and they have no experience. Uh, there are no, they, they cannot go into earth, they cannot, um, because the, the earth is uh, as solid as stone, you can only blow and you can only explode them by hand grenades. You cannot go, you cannot dig out the trenches, you have to make improvised um, uh, snow walls. But anyhow, um, uh, he he did a great job to to manage all the thing. And uh, um, uh, first uh, first of all, uh, the 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 Germans uh, did were not able to make a tight defense lines, uh, a tight perimeter, because they they they, uh, they just did not possess enough troops, enough equipment. Uh, they organized it as a uh, strongholds uh, they controlled uh, with their artillery they controlled the uh, uh, access areas to the strongholds uh, and they had these snow walls and they had the villages they turned villages to small fortresses uh, they turned uh, they had only machine guns and mortars light mortars and they have artillery behind them to control the russians who were trying to uh, capture them and uh, this system of uh, defense uh, went all right i mean uh, um, despite all the all the all the men despite all the heavy artillery uh, russians did not manage to break through um, so uh, as i said my uh, grandfather was a part uh, of this battle from starting from end of january uh, uh, sorry end of february they arrived from moscow and they had to um, had to move uh, 100 kilometers uh, per uh, on foot just to arrive to the battlefield because uh, the supply station where they were unloaded were very very far from that and there were no uh, no roads the terrain was uh, very difficult there were no no paved uh, roads uh, almost swamps and uh, lots of forests. Um, so the Germans um, uh, were actually organized as uh, they have always uh, mobile units uh, who would be redeployed to the most endangerous part uh, uh, where the Russians attacked and uh, uh, moving their troops very fast and uh, having a good cooperation between artillery, between the uh, air reconnaissance and between uh, the, these mobile units uh, who, would help, who, who would help, they uh, organize actually um, a good defense. Um, uh, the, uh, what uh, Germans really needed at that time were uh, these uh, um, Russian Valenki. They uh, have uh, taken them from uh, these felt boots from Russian soldiers. If they took the Valenki from uh, the dead corpses uh, of Russian soldiers shot nearby their positions. And they also needed these white ropes as a snow camouflage. Uh, this is actually one of the Germans, uh, this is a rare picture, one of the Germans uh, who crossed over to Russian positions um, in March 1942. This also, uh, the, these are the soldiers from the unit of my grandfather. Uh, but the, it was actually rarely the case that the Germans crossed over to Russians. It was um, um, most often that the uh, Russian soldiers did cross over to Germans because they were uh, bad supplied and uh, they were very badly supplied and they um, there was they had some problems with the morale at that time because uh, they had to sit uh, in the snow. The Russians uh, were not possible. It was not possible. For them to stay overnight in villages because the fighting did uh, were done in the field uh, uh, close uh, and uh, on, on the other side there were germans behind these walls with their machine guns they had to uh, they did this uh, absolutely suicidal frontal attacks uh, i don't know how um, my grandfather managed to survive uh, from uh, the end of february till the till july uh, because uh, the fighting day and the losses were really very, very heavy. Um, the most uh, remarkable thing about this battle viewing from the German side was these, um, the supply of German troops. So the initial plan of the Russians uh, uh, was actually, we 
we won't spend lots of efforts uh, on uh, this uh, on destroying them because they are cut off of their supplies and uh, they would run out of ammunition and food very fast and they would have to surrender um, uh, but uh, the Germans decided it other way they uh, actually organized uh, a very uh, a very effective airlift operation uh, one of the um, uh, German commanders uh, who, uh, who was in charge of it was Fritz Morzig, who was uh, com who commanded the German Luftwaffe's transport aviation of on the Eastern Front at that time. I found this picture in the German Federal Archive, and uh, he was uh, interrogated after the war. And all the figures I will uh, tell you today are actually taken from his uh, interrogation report. Um, so the Germans organized um, the uh, airlift operation. So all the equipment, all the uh, food for soldiers uh, and horses, there were more than 20,000 horses uh, needed for the German artillery and for the German internal supplies inside the pocket, were, uh, were uh, provided with food uh, and all the need and all the need uh, by air. It is actually... Um, also, one of the uh, it is actually the first uh, example of such operation uh, in the whole war history. Um, uh, the Germans used Junkers 52 uh, aircrafts, which were originally designed as uh, um, bombers, actually, but uh, during in course of the uh, World War II, they were used mainly as uh, transport vehicles, transport uh, aircraft. Sorry. Um, so the Germans also produced lots of um, um, uh, containers uh, which were parachuted down from the uh, airplanes directly to the positions of, uh, uh, of the Germans. Uh, uh, and uh, um, these containers were actually uh, very uh, solid. They were, uh, so they provided uh, for the safety of the ammunition which was inside, for, for, for they provided for the safety of the food which was inside. And um, uh, the Russian soldiers were very, very lucky if uh, the wind blown to their positions and they got this uh, German containers. Uh, one of the Russian soldiers told me that they were happy to discover the chocolate inside of this uh, container. He, uh, it was absolutely unthinkable in the Red Army to have it, uh, to, to have a chocolate. Um, and also uh, they got German uh, bread, which was packed in um, 1939, as the inscription said, uh, but it was still uh, soft and uh, tasted well, he said. So um, uh, the Germans um, were able to supply it because uh, uh, it was, not too far uh, for them to reach uh, Demyansk uh, from Pskov and uh, uh, Duneburg, dog of Pilsen uh, today. It was only 900 to, uh, kilometers away from Duneburg both ways for aircraft or 700 kilometers from Pskov both sides. Uh, and so it was possible to do uh, these flights under fuel. And uh, the Germans organized two airstrips inside a pocket. One of them was 600 meters and the other uh, one is 800 meters long. And uh, it was not uh, um, an easy task to land at these conditions. And uh, the Germans uh, used their best pilots for these flights uh, because um, uh, it was really a challenging will task to fly over the Russian positions as low as possible and then uh, land uh, uh, near Demyansk when you are, have to fight against the Russian fighters uh, and the Russian uh, air defense. So for the, <clears throat> for the first time in the world history for two and a half months, from February the 20th till May the 6th, the Demyansk pocket was supplied solely by Luftwaffe, which was, of course, a great, great achievement uh, um, glorified by the German historian. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Germans, um, uh, one of the German um, soldiers who were flown to the pocket, uh, to, the, to the man's pocket, 
um, told me as a reinforcement told me that it was a, a very very um, uh, challenging for, for him to to get there because uh, uh, on on one hand he had to be a, a machine gunner during this flight because the pilots uh, did not have enough uh, people there they they used these uh, germans uh, uh, infantrymen uh, as a machine gunners and they were he, they were instructed when to fight uh, when to open fire and uh, <clears throat> um, first uh, he he told me first they got up to 800 meters when they started in Pskov uh, 8 and then went to the Russian positions. When they were near, uh, near the Russian positions, they tried to lower as uh, as low as possible. He saw, he, he said he was even able to see the faces of Russian soldiers when they were passing by. And uh, he thought, oh gosh, they could crush, they could uh, down our airplane even by uh, by throwing a hand grenade, probably. Uh, but uh, and then when they passed uh, the um, um, Russian lines, um, almost touching the treetops, they uh, went uh, up again, and in, in a few minutes they landed. And um, um, when he, they landed, they, he saw a lots of crashed airplanes uh, at the edge of this land strip. He said uh, he was instructed uh, when they landed to run as fast as possible out from the airplane because at that time normally the Russian fighters E uh, I uh, 16 uh, or the Rathas, how the Germans called them, arrived and tried to. Uh, destroy the uh, Germans uh, who arrived in um, Yemiansk. So it was really, really a risky uh, operation, and the Germans had great losses actually having these uh, supplies. It was very costly for them. Speaking about the, f the figures, um, um, they, the Germans accomplished over 14,000 uh, flights uh, in course of from February 20 to May 18. The, um, uh, they uh, brought over 24,000 tons of loads, different loads. Uh, they uh, even carried food for, for horses uh, using the um, expensive, uh, um, using the expensive um, uh, fuel for the for, yeah. for this air bridge, and. Uh, they also had to, to bring the fuel inside the pocket and to bring reinforcement. And uh, they took uh, almost 22, uh, more than 22,000 wounded troops out of the pocket. With um, I was shocked to, to know that uh, some uh, infantrymen f f inside the pocket were allowed to go on, on leaves uh, wow. during this, this time and return back to their troops uh, by air. Actually, uh, of course, uh, some um, some people think, some uh, historians think it was uh, actually uh, uh, like uh, uh, spending uh, gold on, um, uh, like spending gold on feeding horses with uh, yeah. with hay. Yeah. I mean, uh, for, from the German side, of course, uh, it was uh, partially, and uh, the Germans decided that they 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 would need. Um, a land uh, corridor to supply the troops. It was not possible uh, to do it for a long time. Um, uh, and uh, in, uh, I will, I will tell him about this a bit later. And just um, to interrupt and give you give yeah. you a second to, to collect your thoughts, I just remind people that if you're interested in the airlifting aspect of history, Robert Forsyth is on the channel next Wednesday talking about the airlifts to Stalingrad. So similar subject. The Luftwaffe are bringing in the transport there, but the point you're going to make later on in this show is that is that everything that's happening here is both foretelling, foreshadowing, and leading to problems that will happen later on in Stalingrad. That's the the whole connection you're making is that is that the resources used here maybe could have been used better elsewhere, and it it, it sets things up for for uh, for the Stalingrad situation later later on. But I'll, I'll let you get back. And uh, basically, people are loving it, by the way. They're loving the detail. They're loving the, the examination of, the, of, the, of everything. So um, keep going. It's all, it's all good. OK. 
Um, so uh, this whole war about was actually about the logistics, about the supply of troops, and uh, when the Russian Stavkas and when the Russian uh, Northwestern Front saw that the initial plan went wrong, it was a failure. The, the German did not surrender because they are supplied. Uh, they thought we should do something about that. Let's try the airborne operation. Um, uh, the planning of this airborne operation was imp improvised. It was. Uh, uh, when I started this, uh, I thought it was a pure chaos. I mean, uh, they um, <clears throat> first they uh, um, they decided to to cut the line to to uh, to bring these uh, uh, airborne brigades uh, to the um, to the rear of the uh, 10th Army Corps to know and uh, to take the railway stations to cut the um, German supplies. But uh, then they suddenly realized they do not have enough airplanes and uh, they, it would be too far for uh, to supply these troops uh, during operation. And uh, they, they, this plan is too ambitious. And then they uh, decided to concentrate solely on the Demian's pockets. So they decided to uh, deploy free airborne brigades. Um, these airborne brigades uh, uh, often um, uh, are described as elite troops. Uh, it is actually not the case because only one of them were really uh, experienced guys, but the rest was the youngsters, maybe 18 or 20 years of age, one or two jumps from with parachute from uh, that that's it i mean uh, they they never get uh, proper uh, training and proper equipment uh, for for this operation and uh, uh, the initial plan was that uh, they will also parachute it down to demians to capture all uh, the airstrips to destroy the communications to capture the german the staff of the second army corps but then they also uh, found out that uh, this uh, won't be possible because we don't have enough airplanes to bring them in and uh, this uh, northern western front uh, vatutin and kurochkin said okay then let's use the skis the german lines are not tight uh, they uh, it is possible to infiltrate inside the pocket uh, from the north and from uh, from the east and so they did. Uh, the operation started in uh, uh, late February and beginning of the March uh, 1942. And uh, these poor guys, they had um, only uh, equipment, uh, only ammunition and food for three or four days of fighting. And the uh, time planning was also a catastrophe. I mean, uh, uh, it was not... Uh, uh, taking in, in, into consideration what terrain and what uh, area they would operate, they would have to operate because it was snow. It took uh, really a great effort for the Red Army even to bring uh, these people close to the border of the Demiansk pocket because the roads uh, were uh, snowed uh, or covered with snow and they had no enough um, transportation to uh, vehicles to bring them. To the, uh, to the border of the demands pocket. And when they uh, uh, were in sight, uh, the Germans, um, this effect of unexpectedness was lost. The Germans were very well aware of this operation. They, uh, they had uh, uh, air reconnaissance, they observed these guys. They, uh, from the first day of operation, they put them on heavy artillery fire. They managed uh, to disperse them. They were split in small groups uh, and uh, fought for one on two weeks. And they tried to um, capture the German staff. Uh, they thought uh, it is was still in the village of Dobrosli, but, in the, uh, but it was not because the Germans um, uh, the, the Germans knew that the, the plan, uh, how the plan ran, and they uh, removed the stuff uh, from there. So uh, they had great losses in uh, even uh, trying to capture the airstrips. They lost uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of men, and uh, uh, from initial 9,000 uh, thousand troops, uh, they were probably half. Uh, by the end of the second or the third week and uh, uh, 
the Russian uh, commandment uh, tried to resupply them from air, but it wasn't possible. It was not effective. They, they just have not enough uh, food. And uh, when you read the documents about, uh, when you read the communications between the commandment of these brigades and the uh, northwestern front, you, it just uh, runs as uh, uh, give us food, we are starving, we, are hu we have hunger, uh, we cannot uh, fight because people have no ammunition. Um, and uh, they will, it was really a, a disaster. Uh, I mean, these people uh, showed that much heroism and the disunbearable conditions. They were not even allowed to make fires because Germans would see the smoke and uh, uh, set them, put them on artillery fire. They were sitting in the snow with no food, no ammunition. Um, and uh, it, by the end, by the mid of, uh, April, they even had uh, they were even had cases of cannibalism where uh, the Germans took many of them as uh, prisoners of war, or many of them crossed over to Germans because there was such uh, uh, in uh, in the lo low morale and in uh, such an apathy because uh, of these unbearable conditions, uh, and the Germans accurately. Um, interrogated them on all the uh, cases of cannibalism, how they ate the flesh of their of their uh, uh, of their of their comrades, and uh, used this in, in in the propaganda. Look, we are fighting. We are really fighting uh, against the Untermenschen, um, who are eating each other. And um, um, so they they were finally allowed to break out, and only. Uh, two, maybe uh, one and a half, two thousand men managed to get out of the pocket uh, back to the Russian lines. So the unit of my grandfather was trying to help them striking from the south. Uh, but they did manage to help them because the German lines were tight. And um, the corpses of these guys are still lying where they, where they die and where they were... Uh, um, Shot because uh, this terrain is really difficult to access right now. Um, these are swamps and forests, and this is uh, there are still unpaved roads to get there. And I know some enthusiasm, enthusiasts from the Russian side who are uh, willing to find the bones of them who are studying the German uh, uh, documents on this operation and uh, searching every summer for the corpses, for the for the bones of these people, and to 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 bury them. And I also helped to translate uh, some uh, German documents for them for this operation. They actually paid for a great monument for the for this wow. operation. But but it well uh, uh, it, it well not all right. It was it went uh, uh, as an absolute disaster in in terms of planning. I'm glad you mentioned the roads there because uh, Prit Buttar mentioned that on Monday that even the area that he wrote we talked about in in the, in the you know uh, east of Leningrad, even when he was doing his research, checking on Google Earth now roads that you look on on a map as being a main you know fairly main road between two towns or villages. When you actually go on Google Earth, it's gravel. It's still gravel tracks. And this is this is 80 plus years after World War II, and I think it reminds us again that when we're studying the Eastern Front. And we look at the railway lines you mentioned uh, and, the, and the major highways. Yes, they are there, but a lot of the smaller roads are just in the middle of nowhere. They're not proper roads. And as you say, just huge swathes of marshland and areas that even eight decades on are still very difficult to get to. And I think it's re worth reminding ourselves how much of the Eastern Front is in areas that we, people still to this day don't really get access to. Yeah, it is not gravel. Even it is not even gravel. It is just pure uh, pure soil, and it is uh, uh, sometimes uh, when it's uh, after heavy rains, it is impossible for normal vehicles. If you don't have uh, four four wheel drives, you you you, you, uh, you have you would have difficulties to arrive to most of the to some of the villages, uh, remote villages in this area. Um, uh, the uh, uh, so this was the um, war of logistics, as I said. It was uh, um, uh, especially in uh, when the spring uh, arrived in April and the beginning of May. 
this muddy season, as Rasputin says, it's called in Russian, uh, when all the uh, all the terrain turned into mud and water um, was uh, difficult for both sides, even not only for the Germans inside the pocket, but also for the uh, for the Russian troops who were encircling the the Germans. Um, I wrote some reports on that uh, the soldier was suffering because they were simply not supplied with food at that time. For two, two or three weeks in April, they had um, 200 grams of bread per day. That's all. Uh, I mean, what they what they got because they ju they just ran out of supplies. Um, when the weather got better, the Germans um, built roads inside the encirclement, as uh, you can see on the picture to the right. Uh, this is a German uh, road made uh, of wood just to supply um, the uh, front lines from inside of the pocket. Um, one of the war correspondents at Northwestern Front, Daniel Fibig, wrote in his diary in mid-April uh, 1942, Spring, spring, the army is starving. There is no supply. In some units, uh, they receive 100 and even 50 grams of dried bread per day. Uh, the last few days, they have been tossing us food from U2s. The drop, uh, they drop without parachutes. We get dried bread turned into crumbs, concentrates mixed with granulated sugar, crumpled cans of canned food. You compare daily regular and scheduled U2, U52 flights over our heads. Both anger and bitterness are in our hearts. Oh, Russia. He actually, um, then uh, 1943, he got sentenced uh, for 10 years uh, in Gulag for this uh, war diary. Uh, he was uh, sentenced for the anti Soviet uh, propaganda, as it was, as it ran that. Uh, and then he, and he was really 10 years in, imprisoned in Gulag until 53. Um, so um, when, the, uh, when the, the spring arrived, the Germans were able to, to start the land operation to break through the land corridor between this uh, uh, Isle of Demyansk and the mainland at Stara Rusa. Uh, it was commanded by the Walter Kult uh, von Seidlitz Kurzbach from the German side. It was actually a famous general uh, uh, of Wehrmacht who then surrendered uh, with the Sixth Army in Stalingrad uh, a year later. And uh, he's actually, actually a unique person in the war history of uh, World War II because he was sentenced to death both by Hitler and Stalin. Um, by Hitler um, uh, after the surrender of in, at Stalingrad and after he he knew that uh, <clears throat> Walter uh, Zeidlitz von Kurtberg decided to help the Russian uh, propaganda. Uh, to, he actually collaborated with the Russian army, urging the Wehrmacht to uh, surrender and then convinced Paulus also to help the Russian propaganda in uh, doing so, and uh, when uh, after the war, when he was uh, uh, when there was th there was no need uh, of him actually, Stalin decided to um, make he, made him uh, a war criminal, and he was taken to court and first sentenced to death, and then it was replaced by 25 years of uh, imprisonment. He's uh, he was sitting actually only for six years, and then was allowed to return to West Germany and he died so he died in Germany at home. Um, so the Germans um, did manage to uh, to break out this land corridor and uh, such resolve this problem with the uh, supplies of the troops. Uh, the Ramoshova corridor called after the village of Ramoshova at Lower River uh, which which is uh, depicted here um, uh, was an area of heavy fighting during the whole time of the uh, of the rest of 1942 and 1943. The Russians 
tried to cut off off this corridor uh, because it was the main arteria connecting uh, Demyansk to the mainland and to the, important for the supplies, but they, all the efforts uh, went wrong. So um, my uh, uh, grandfather's uh, unit was also, um, the, um, first it was um, trying to break out, to break, uh, to break the jump lines from the south and then they were relocated to a Ramoshova corridor in uh, August 1942, and they uh, have also great, great losses there. Uh, it was uh, in this time without my grandfather who, uh, who died uh, in the military hospital in July. It was also a problem with the, the Russian logistics, uh, with the proper logistics that he was not, um, um, he was not brought to the military hospital very fast. He got wounded. Uh, in July, uh, it was hot, and uh, he didn't get this proper uh, medical treatment uh, right at the front line, and he was brought to the military hospital in two days. It took him two days uh, to get there, and when he got there, he already uh, was having the gangrene, and uh, he died uh, a day after. Um, these uh, are the pictures uh, taken in uh, summer uh, of 1942. This is the uh, unit of my grandfather. Uh, they are trying to um, uh, to take some terrain from German. Uh, they actually were the most successful um, uh, of all the Russian units uh, encircling the Germans. They, uh, uh, they gained some terrain from Germans, but of course uh, it uh, didn't resolve the whole problem with the pocket because the Germans just pulled back to the prepared positions uh, in the rear and um, the whole story repeated. Um, Could you just but, pull, go back to that, that previous photo for a second? Yeah, there? yeah. It, it's clearly it's clearly staged. I mean, we talked about that with Prit. Is that, that with the, with the Soviet photography from World War II, a lot of the classic images that we are familiar with today, they are they are staged to some extent, and they're putting a a, a, a face of the battle that is 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 for propaganda purposes. Although, of course, the British, the Americans, everybody else does that as well. Propaganda photos are not unique to the Soviet Union, but if someone like yourself who studied the German archives and the and the Soviet archives. You know, you're talking about this is when you were growing up, the, the 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 way the people of the Soviet Union were looking back on the Great Patriotic War. And we know that by 1944, 45, the Red Army was a much more efficient um, mechanism than it was earlier in the war. But how difficult is it to look back and study the 42, 43 era and not find the accounts have been rewritten with the experience of later on the war. No one at the time in, in the Red Army was admitting that things weren't perfect in 42, 43. So they attribute later qualities of the Soviet Army to the early early era. Does that make sense, what I'm saying there? Yes, right. Uh, absolutely. It is staged. And, um, but uh, the unit of my grandfather, was it wasn't um, um, a normal unit, I would say, because it was uh, mainly stuffed with uh, volunteers fighters uh, from Moscow. Um, and they had lots of uh, um, people. Normally, uh, nobody in the normal unit would have uh, even uh, uh, photographs uh, because yes. uh, uh, the cameras were missing. And uh, but this was not. Um, it was um, um, a big propaganda, uh, I would say, unit because uh, it was mainly stuffed uh, first of, uh, with the communists, and mm. the, there were many, um, many. Uh, they, they they had uh, war correspondents there. They had uh, uh, writers there. They had uh, actors. They had uh, professors. They had lots of students. They a uh, lot of educated people, and it was uh, called uh, Third Moscow Communist Rifle Division first. And then uh, when they arrived at the Northwestern Front, they were called 130th Rifle Division. Um, but uh, the people uh, were, uh, in the first, especially in the first fights, were the same. Um, yeah, I mean... Um, um, when you study when you study this uh, history, you see uh, 
lots of uh, you see lots of examples of heroism, but you see lots of uh, examples of low morale. And uh, this is this this period, 1942, 1943, was uh, not uh, um, what what the time was the time where most of these people were not sure how it will uh, went further, whether they will be successful against the Germans or whether the Germans would prevail. I mean, uh, uh, this is only after Stalingrad, after Kursk, they were sure that they will win. But before that, uh, it was not clear at all. Mm, thank you. Um, I mean, um, the Germans did, uh, they did a great job to improve their, their logistics because um, um, uh, this land corridor uh, also needed lots of vehicles to transport uh, the goods. Uh, the airplanes still operated until October 1942 uh, uh, and the land uh, corridor was near was really uh, not broad enough. It was controlled by the Russian artillery um, and the main portion of that was very, very risky uh, to pass. And uh, the Germans uh, uh, understood that they would, uh, would have to withdraw one day. And they, uh, uh, they were facing the problem, how we can evacuate, how can we evacuate all the heavy equipment we have? And the Germans uh, decided to build a railway line. I was shocked to know that uh, they managed in course of 1942, despite all this uh, heavy efforts of the Russians uh, and the Russian artillery, they managed to build uh, a real railway line uh, supplying the Mianzk uh, pocket uh, from the mainland. Uh, the distance they, 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 they should cover was a long one, 71 kilometers. And they had many obstacles in that way. They had to build 28 bridges, uh, the, the, the biggest of them over the Lovat River, which is a rather a big, a big river. I mean, it was a really um, uh, great achievement for them. To, uh, so by, by December 1942, this uh, railway station, this railway um, line was uh, uh, operating and the Germans supplied the troops uh, uh, as you will see in this picture, they uh, sent troops, ammunition, everything uh, using this railway. And um, um, but the time was coming. The um, uh, this is the the edge between 1942 and 1943. We have this encirclement in Stalingrad. The Germans understand that the they would have to withdraw, otherwise they would be killed. Uh, 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 the Russians put so many forces uh, from both sides of this land corridor that one day they will uh, do it. They will do the job. They will cut us. They will just destroy us. Um, the Germans are still deciding whether they sh should uh, pull back or not. Hitler is also uh, not sure. Um, but then it, 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 uh, it comes uh, to the uh, um, to Stalingrad uh, and the surrender of the Sixth Army, uh, the Russian uh, Stavka is planning uh, a big offensive operation also here. Uh, the the plan is also too ambitious. It is called Polar Star, uh, the, the, the end of uh, um, 40, uh, 42, the beginning of 43. We have to break uh, again around the uh, Ilmen Lake and go to up to the uh, up to the sea there and uh, cutting uh, the army uh, the army group north apart uh, uh, we will uh, help the Leningrad uh, we will cut the 16th army and it was uh, also a very very ambitious plan um, which was never fulfilled actually um, by that time uh, the commander of the northwestern front was Semyon Timoshenko um, uh, who took the command from October 94. Kurchkin was dismissed um, due to failures to, uh, to cut the corridor. And uh, Timoshenko was set the, the task to, dis to destroy the German pocket, uh, to, uh, to 
uh, go further north uh, and to help Lendra. And um, in view of this, uh, in, in view of these uh, plans of the Russians, um, the Hitler allowed the withdrawal from Dumyansk. Um, that, that, this was on, actually only possible after he knew that uh, Paulus VI army in, in Stalingrad surrendered. It was only after February the 1st, 1943. And uh, uh, Germans were preparing to withdraw and the main task for uh, Semyon Timoshenko was to prevent them uh, of going out of this pocket. Uh, of taking all the equipment and all the artillery of all the equipment they had there. Um, but uh, it also went wrong. Uh, I mean, um, uh, the, um, the plan was also too ambitious. Uh, the, um, despite the heavy forces uh, he had, he possessed at that moment, it was not possible. The Germans um, using all the uh, logistics they built uh, the, managed to um, withdraw in an organized way and uh, even not letting uh, to the Russian army, to the Red Army, uh, their artillery and all the heavy equipment. Um, and as a result, uh, Timoshenko was also dismissed from his command uh, during this failure. Uh, so the situation by March the 1st, uh, 1943, uh, looked like this. So the German reduced the front line um, and they managed to organize a defense. So the, um, all the planned uh, operation, uh, the Polar Star operation was also a big failure. Um, Nikolai Voronov, chief marshal of Russian artillery, uh, was uh, writing about this operation um, in uh, in his book in 1943. It was after Stalin. It was the Khrushchev time. He was probably uh, brave enough to to say the truth about this operation only at that at that point of time. After brilliant victories on Don and Volga, failures on this front were depressing. It was clear that a major operation should not have been started here. Again, irritation accumulated in my soul against those who made beautiful plans for the operation without bothering to study the conditions of the terrain, routes of communications, climate features. Uh, we doomed equipment to destruction, lost many people and incalculable amount of ammunition in clearly and directions. I think this is, um, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the quote which can be used not only uh, uh, to this Polar Star operation, but to the whole efforts of the uh, Red Army in course of the of this 13 month of encirclement uh, around Demyansk. And uh, um, I believe um, uh, I believe uh, it was. Uh, a real um, failure of the uh, Red Army. I mean, uh, it showed that at that point in time, it was not uh, good enough. It was not able enough to coordinate its effort, especially in logistics, especially in cooperation between the artillery, uh, air force and land forces. And all of this, uh, um, um, and all of this, uh, resulted in this uh, failure. So the main effects of the demand battles, the main consequences of uh, the Mianz battle um, was that uh, uh, the Germans um, be, being encircled in, uh, in Stalingrad, uh, the Germans believed that they would, uh, that it, 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 it wasn't actually a big problem for them. Um, they have this experience by supplying uh, the uh, Demian's pocket by air. Mm, they have this experience by organizing an effective defense um, in just uh, open field uh, without uh, um, uh, pre pre prepared positions. They have this experience uh, with the airlifts and so on. And uh, first they, they thought um, uh, <clears throat> 
they were not allow they, they were not allowing to uh, to withdraw they were not allowing to break out and they lost lots uh, lots of time and um, uh, thinking that that they would be able to um, uh, to do so to to supply them and to organize the defense but the picture at that time was completely different um, the uh, there were m much more personnel encircled uh, uh, Stalingrad. They needed over six, over 700 tons per day uh, of equip of uh, uh, ammunition and food and everything. Um, the Germans did not possess enough aircrafts at that time because they lost lots of them at Demian's corporation mm. to supply. And all this uh, went wrong, actually. Uh, that, that was a great miscalculation at Stalingrad. And um, that helped uh, the Russian army uh, to uh, that that helped the Russian army to have this great victory at Sandra. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thanks. Uh, thanks for attention. I am ready uh, to answer the questions if there are any. Well, brilliant. And um, I mean, it's it's interesting because you know we're using the words failure and victory and things like that. But it seems that this battle has both things for both sides. You know, that the Red Army clearly don't get everything right, but the Germans make mistakes that then influences how they come out of the Stalingrad battle later on. And you can definitely see that techniques and doctrine employed by the Red Army here do get better later on it's that it's that it's a step in the right direction even if even if the result immediately isn't there so it's 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 interesting that the interpretation of it if you if you look at it in isolation it gives you one version if you look at it in the course of the whole war i think it gives you a different a different understanding does that make sense Yes, sure. Uh, I, I completely agree with you because, uh, of course, uh, the Russian generals were learning how to deal yeah. with Germans during the course of that. But uh, the price they paid for that uh, yeah. was immense. I mean, uh, was it really necessary to offer so, uh, so many people uh, to uh, to spend so much effort uh, just to control? Because the main uh, reason uh, they were um, trying to <clears throat> To get rid of this demand pocket was uh, the idea of the Stalin that uh, this terrain could be used uh, later on uh, for the German uh, coming forward and uh, for the Germans. Um, maybe it, it would be better for, for the Russian army just to control them uh, encircled and not to uh, spend so many lives and so, mm. uh, so many material and effort to trying to um, uh, to destroy them because uh, um yeah they were making too many mistakes and these mistakes should have names uh, we should uh, write the history we should uh, um, how can we learn from the history if you don't know who was uh, doing uh, what uh, at what particular period of time who was doing good who was doing bad yeah. um and that's the main reason actually of the history Okay. Uh, otherwise, we cannot learn it from it. Well, thanks for that. We've got a few questions. So World War II Analyze is saying, have you discussed the effect of Demyansk on German pilot training? Um, I didn't went that uh, that deep in, in, in my research. But uh, of course, I knew that uh, from books that uh, they lost uh, uh, nearly 1,000 people, uh, mm. some portion of them were um, uh, pilots, maybe 300 pilots or something. Uh, uh, and they, they, that was the best pilots, actually, because this uh, uh, task was uh, not an easy one to, to, to fly to Demyansk and back. And, um, um, but I, I'm sure they, they should have... Uh, um make some lessons out of Demyansk for the for the, for the further training uh, the Germans but uh, uh, for, for example inter interrogation of Fritz Morzig I found nothing about uh, right. uh, the training okay well I mean you've you've partly covered this with this question but Eric is asking do you think there was any possibility the Red Army could have destroyed the Demyansk pocket or was it beyond their capacity in 41 42 along with terrain airlift etc you kind of answered that already but but if you wouldn't mind addressing it again 
Well, I'm not sure uh, whether uh, how to answer it, yes or no. Uh, maybe, maybe yes, if they would have uh, better commands. Maybe yes, if they would um, use uh, uh, the equipment and the man uh, in a proper way. Maybe, maybe yes, if they would uh, organize it, uh, um, uh, the, the better logistics. Uh, but I'm, I'm not capable to to, to analyze of this. I'm, I'm lacking uh, information of the whole. World. I only, um, I only collected some, um, basically, uh, the uh, evidence from the from the trenches, from the soldiers' perspective, yeah. actually. Um, so. Um, I'm sure the, the the Russian army could have been more effective. Uh, but then, by that they, same they had argument, everything. they had everything for that, yeah. But by that same argument, the German army could also have been a more effective. That that is the nature of forty two forty three. Is the the difference between the two armies is different to how it was earlier and later. In, in you know, in forty one, the balance of power was probably in favor of the Germans, and by forty four, the balance of power was definitely in favor of the of the Red Army. But forty two forty three. I guess you don't need to change many things to make some of these battles have a different result. It, the, the, the balance was much more, was finer between these units and everybody was having a difficult terrain. It was giving some opportunity for commanders to shine and others were not doing very well. So it's, it, you know, saying could it have happened? Of course it could have happened, but it could have gone worse. But um, Sean Brennan is asking, he said, maybe I missed earlier, but why on earth did the Russians think Demians was appropriate for airborne troops? A good question, uh, Sean. I mean, um, um, yeah, it was not uh, actually uh, um, probably uh, probably if they would be uh, if they would have dropped them from air, uh, um, they could uh, they they could achieve more, but uh, um, because of the lack of the airplanes. Uh, mm. They only could send them with the skis, and the yeah. skis. Uh, I uh, I remember uh, one of the German officers in, in war diary mentioned that they were fighting against this uh, um, uh, Russian airborne troops, and they were uh, they were sitting behind this snow wall, and the uh, Russian war, uh, airborne troops were attacking them frontally, and they uh, destroyed them with machine guns and artillery. And then when they went close to the corpses, they see they saw that the uh, uh, skis, uh, that the uh, that the felt boots, the valen keys, were nailed to the skis because uh, there was also lack of this special binding between the ski and the valen, uh, and the boots, and the, uh, they had to nail this uh, valen key to to. Uh, uh, to the skis uh, just to to <laughs> to get into this and to go because uh, um, it, it also shows the level of, of the equipment they had yeah and the level of training uh, some uh, of the uh, some of the soldiers were interrogated by the Germans and they uh, said they they never had proper training uh, uh, on how to use the skis that uh, I was also shocked because uh, um, they probably were thought that they will also be parachuted down and not using the skis. Uh, this this operation uh, for me is uh, uh, for me is uh, an example of really bad planning and uh, uh, not taking into account uh, completely the terrain and the and the climate and uh, the yeah. Okay, well, that, that was a great question. answer to that. And I think my last question will be, because we will we will think bring things to end, is that, you know, you, you're giving us an objective uh, account of this. You're using accounts from both sides. We've got the 80 years of historiography. You've been access to archives. So you're you're giving us a, a, a warts and all uh, presentation. But from the point of view of if you were a Soviet citizen in, let's say, March 1943, David's question here is from a Soviet propaganda perspective, did Demyansk allow for a great boosting of the morale among Soviet people? Because I'm assuming if you were living in a in a tenement in Moscow or you were in a farm somewhere, that your you the version of this battle you were being given by the Soviet press was very much of a victory, that we are starting to defeat the, the, the invaders, we're, we're on the upper hand. So, so at the time, 
was it heralded as a as a as a victory, and was it useful for the for the morale of the public? Um, yeah, but, uh, but only uh, in the final stage uh, yeah. in February uh, in February 1943 it was the case. Uh, of course, we were we are taking Demyansk, we are taking Russian terrain back, we are liberating uh, the local population. Uh, but it was completely silenced uh, uh, all the time uh, before. I mean, uh, there were no uh, territorial gains. There were no. Um, there were no uh, effective operations. They were not able. The Germans managed to build this uh, terrain uh, link between Demyansk and Starorussa. There was nothing to report to uh, boost the morale, uh, and uh, the. Uh, even the, it was not reported that some portions of the local population of the Myansk uh, area uh, was willing to uh, uh, to go with Germans actually to the Germans lines, and uh, okay. some of the some of the local population was uh, uh, evacuated uh, with the Germans. This this is uh, this was of course not also not mentioned by the Russian press by the Soviet press. So Demyansk as a whole, this uh, the battle, uh, this eff this uh, uh, efforts to destroy Demyansk pocket was silenced by the Russian historian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I, I, I was, I, I when I was uh, researching this story. I never found a, a, a good account on it, uh, especially mm. on this airborne operation. Is it was completely forgotten. It was completely silenced by the Russian historiography until uh, recently. David Glantz was one of the first uh, yeah, to write yeah. uh, to write about this airborne operation. Well, well, the last question we're having is 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 you know, are you still hopeful that your manuscript will get published? Because, you know, you've you've kindly given us the presentation today on World War II TV, but it seems to me that there's definitely a book in this. So, I mean, you're, you're in Toronto now. Uh, are, are, is there any chance, do you think, of this of this work be, being able to hit our shelves at some point? Um, who knows? Uh, I, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I'll try, of course. Uh, one of the reasons I went here to the World War II channel uh, is to, to, to take some uh, attention to my uh, efforts, to my research. Probably I will uh, find some contacts. Um, I'm, I'm open to everything. Um, um, only, the only problem is that the, uh, it is only accessible uh, in Russian uh, at the moment. There is uh, no uh, English or German translation, but surely I translated lots of German documents for, um, into Russian and uh, um, the main uh, audience of my book, as I thought, was actually uh, the Russian audience. But uh, I tried to, to, to publish it in Russia, but uh, failed because uh, two of the publishers said, um, your book is uh, too uh, aggressive towards the Russian, the Red Army. It, it, it is not enough uh, heroism of Russian of Russian uh, soldiers inside. The, there is not much evidence on the Russian heroism, and too much criticism on the Russian uh, uh, on the Red Army. Uh, but um, it is not uh, my text, actually. Uh, it is a compilation of evidence and yeah, documents. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll leave it with just saying good luck with it, and I'll I'll put you Thank in touch with perhaps Prit Butar and some others who who have contacts with public publishers, and maybe maybe someone will pick it up. That'd be fantastic if you could come back in a year or two's time and and, and have a copy of the book in front of you. That'd be fantastic. But for this evening, I'm just going to say thank you very much for giving us this presentation. I'll take you off screen for a second. I'll bring you back to say goodbye in a second. Folks, tomorrow morning, Ian McGregor, tomorrow morning, tomorrow evening, same time, Ian McGregor is joining us to talk about his amazing book, The Lighthouse of Stalingrad. That's another show not to miss out on. I urge you to come back for that one. I hope you're enjoying this series. But right now, I'm going to bring my guest back in to say thank you very much. Uh, brilliantly presented. The fact you're trilingual, uh, at least trilingual, is, is very good. You've given us a German point of view, the Russian point of view, and it's been marvellous. So thank you very much on behalf of World War II TV. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you, thank you for watching and thank you for your questions. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Paul.